Over 130 years ago, University of California geology professor Joseph LeConte summarized the fossil record. In successive geological faunas, the change seems rather by substitution than by transmutation. Species seem to come in suddenly, with all their specific characters perfect, remain substantially unchanged as long as they last, and then die out and are replaced by others. Certainly, this looks much like immutability of specific forms and supernaturalism of specific origin. Lacan also acknowledges that natural selection cannot explain the appearance of new, irreducibly complex features called novelties in his day. Neither can it explain the first steps of advance toward usefulness. An organ must be already useful before natural selection can take hold of it to improve on it. After acknowledging that the only direct evidence, the fossil record, does not support the idea of gradual change, and that the only theory ever taken seriously as to the causes of these changes can explain everything except anything new, Lacan nevertheless concludes, We are confident that evolution is absolutely certain, not evolution as a special theory, Lamarckian, Darwinian, Spencerian, but evolution as a law of derivation of forms from previous forms. In this sense, it is not only certain, it is axiomatic. The origins of new phenomena are often obscure, even inexplicable, but we never think to doubt that they have a natural cause. For so to doubt is to doubt the validity of reason and the rational constitution of nature. And so, in 1888, Lacan acknowledges what will become clear to anyone who follows the modern debate between Darwinism and intelligent design. Evolution is an axiom, and axioms do not need supporting evidence. A 1980 New York Times article on a meeting at Chicago's Field Museum of Natural History of nearly all the leading evolutionists reports, At issue during the Chicago meeting was macroevolution, a term that is itself a matter of debate, but which generally refers to the evolution of major differences, such as those separating species or larger classifications. Most agree macroevolution is, for example, what made crustaceans different from mollusks. It is the process by which birds and mammals evolved out of reptiles. Darwin suggested that such major products of evolution were the results of very long periods of gradual, natural selection the mechanism that is widely accepted today as accounting for minor adaptations. Darwin, however, knew he was on shaky ground in extending natural selection to account for differences between major groups of organisms. The fossil record of his day showed no gradual transitions between such groups, but he suggested that further fossil discoveries would fill the missing links. The pattern that we were told to find for the last 120 years does not exist, declared Niles Eldridge, a paleontologist from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Eldridge reminded the meeting of what many fossil hunters have recognized as they trace the history of a species through successive layers of ancient sediments. Species simply appear at a given point in geologic time, persist largely unchanged for a few million years, and then disappear. There are very few examples, some say none, of one species shading gradually into another. The New York Times writer assures us, however, that all of this does not suggest weakness in the fact of evolution, only in the perceived mechanism. Even if new features consistently appear suddenly in the fossil record and cannot be explained by natural selection, there is no doubt they were the result of entirely natural causes. That is an axiom that cannot be questioned. Lacan's axiom is the strongest argument against intelligent design. It is certainly understandable that Lacan and other scientists are confident that nothing is beyond the reach of their science. In every other field of science, naturalism has been spectacularly successful. Why should evolutionary biology be so different? To explain why evolution is different, so different that it requires a very different type of explanation, we need to look at what you have to believe to not believe in intelligent design. Peter Uron in College Physics writes, One of the most remarkable simplifications in physics is that only four distinct forces account for all known phenomena. But can four unintelligent forces of physics alone really rearrange atoms into computers and airplanes and science texts? It is difficult to even imagine a more obvious and spectacular violation of the more general statements of the second law of thermodynamics. Such as, for an isolated system, the direction of spontaneous change is from order to disorder. 
But we are all familiar with the standard counter-argument. The Earth is not an isolated system. It receives energy from the sun. Early versions of the second law stated that a quantity called thermal entropy, which measures disorder in the temperature distribution, cannot decrease in an isolated system, but can decrease in an open system. And some scientists generalize this to say that the second law allows any order increase in an open system as long as it is compensated by decreases outside the system. In a Smithsonian Magazine article, Isaac Asimov first acknowledges the apparent conflict between evolution and the second law. You can argue, of course, that the phenomenon of life may be an exception. Life on Earth has steadily grown more complex, more versatile, more elaborate, more orderly over the billions of years of the planet's existence. From no life at all, living molecules were developed, then living cells, then living conglomerates of cells, worms, vertebrates, mammals, finally man. And in man is a three-pound brain, which as far as we know is the most complex and orderly arrangement of matter in the universe. How could the human brain develop out of the primeval slime? How could that vast increase in order, and therefore that vast decrease in entropy, have taken place? But then he uses the usual compensation argument to conclude that there is really no conflict. Remove the sun and the human brain would have not developed. In the billions of years that it took for the human brain to develop, the increase in entropy that took place in the sun was far greater, far, far greater than the decrease that is represented by the evolution required to develop the human brain. Professor Granville Sewell of the University of Texas El Paso has published multiple peer-reviewed articles critiquing the compensation argument. Most recently, in 2017, he published an article in Physics Essays. There, he defined X order to be the negative of the entropy associated with the distribution of any diffusing component X. If X is heat, for example, X order is just thermal order, and showed that the equations for entropy change not only say that X order cannot increase in an isolated system, they also say that in an open system, the X order cannot increase faster than it is imported through the boundary. Thus, he argued, the equations of entropy change do not support the illogical compensation idea. Instead, they illustrate the tautology that If an increase in order is extremely improbable when a system is isolated, it is still extremely improbable when the system is open, unless something is entering which makes it not extremely improbable. The fact that order can increase in an open system does not mean that computers can appear on a barren planet as long as the planet receives solar energy. Something must be entering the system which makes the appearance of computers not extremely improbable. For example, computers. The whole critique of Asimov's widely used compensation argument is very simple and can be understood through a couple of simple stories. Here is a picture of a neighborhood in Moore, Oklahoma, taken before the 2013 tornado hit. Here is a picture taken right after the tornado. Fortunately, another tornado hit Moore a few days later and turned all this rubble back into houses and cars, as seen in this picture. If we asked you why you don't believe our story about the second tornado, you might say this tornado seems to violate the more general statements of the second law of thermodynamics, such as, for an isolated system, the direction of spontaneous change is from order to disorder. But we could use the compensation argument to reply, Moore is not an isolated system because tornadoes receive their energy from the sun and the increase in order in Moore caused by the second tornado is easily compensated by decreases outside the system. Various reasons why the development of civilization does not violate the second law have been given, but all of them can equally well be used to argue that the second tornado did not violate it either. The only difference is there is a theory which is widely accepted in the scientific world as to how civilizations could develop on barren planets, while there is no widely believed theory as to how tornadoes could turn rubble into houses and cars. Nevertheless, suppose we further said that we have a scientific theory that explains how certain rare types of tornadoes, under just the right conditions, really can turn rubble into houses and cars. You doubt our theory? You haven't even heard it yet! If our theory had been studied by the top meteorologists in the world and all agreed that it was plausible, would you take it seriously then? Still no? Two more stories are needed to complete the picture. 
Here is a certain Earth-like planet in a certain solar system as it looked about 4 billion years ago. Next is the same location about 10,000 years ago. At its prime, this large city had tall buildings full of intelligent beings, computers, TV sets, and cell phones. It had libraries full of science texts and novels and airports with jet planes. Scientists explain how civilization developed on this once barren planet as follows. Three or four billion years ago, a collection of atoms formed by pure chance that was able to duplicate itself. These complex collections of atoms were somehow able to preserve their complex structures and pass them on to their descendants, generation after generation. Over a long period of time, the accumulation of duplication errors resulted in more and more elaborate collections of atoms. And eventually, something called intelligence allowed some of these collections of atoms to design buildings and computers and airplanes and write encyclopedias and science texts. Sadly, there's a second story. A few years after these pictures were taken, this planet was hit by a massive solar flare from its sun and all the intelligent beings died. Their bodies decayed and their cells decomposed into simple organic and inorganic compounds. Most of the buildings collapsed immediately into rubble. Those that didn't crumbled eventually. Most of the computers and TV sets inside were smashed into scrap metal. Even those that weren't gradually turned into piles of rust. Most of the books in the libraries burned up. The rest rotted over time. And you can see the final result many years later. This time, the second story is natural and believable. It is the first story that is much more difficult to believe. The second story shows what natural causes normally do. They destroy order. While every other natural process tends to turn order into disorder, Darwinists have always believed that natural selection is the one unintelligent process in the universe that can create spectacular order out of disorder. But despite all the claims about the creative powers of natural selection, it has never actually been observed to produce anything new and complex, only devolution. Lehigh University biochemist Michael Behe, in his 2019 book, Darwin Devolves, writes, Darwinian evolution proceeds mainly by damaging or breaking genes, which counterintuitively sometimes helps survival. In other words, the mechanism is powerfully devolutionary. It promotes the rapid loss of genetic information. Laboratory experiments, field research, and theoretical studies all forcefully indicate that, as a result, random mutation and natural selection make evolution self-limiting. Darwin's mechanism works chiefly by squandering genetic information for short-term gain. So perhaps natural selection of random mutations is like every other unintelligent cause in the universe after all, and tends to create disorder out of order, and not vice versa. Anyone who claims to have a scientific explanation for how unintelligent agents might be able to turn rubble into houses and cars would be expected to produce some very powerful evidence if they want their theory to be taken seriously. The burden of proof should be equally heavy on those who claim to have scientific explanation for how a few unintelligent forces of physics alone could rearrange the basic particles of physics into computers and encyclopedias and Apple iPhones. And there is no evidence that natural selection of random mutations can explain anything other than very minor adaptations. How did such an implausible theory as Darwinism ever get to be so popular? There are two reasons. Lacan's axiom, and the similarities between species, which suggest common descent. In many people's minds, these similarities not only prove common descent, they prove that evolution was the result of entirely natural processes, even in the absence of any evidence that natural selection can explain the major steps of evolution. But the similarities do not really tell us anything about the causes of evolution. And there is an alternate explanation for these similarities. Harvard paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson writes, It is a feature of the known fossil record that most taxa appear abruptly. They are not, as a rule, led up to by a sequence of almost imperceptibly changing forerunners, such as Darwin believed should be usual in evolution. This phenomenon becomes more universal and more intense as the hierarchy of categories is ascended. Gaps among known species are sporadic and often small. 
Gaps among known orders, classes, and phyla are systematic and almost always large. These peculiarities of the record pose one of the most important theoretical problems in the whole history of life. Is the sudden appearance of higher categories a phenomenon of evolution or of the record only, due to sampling bias and other inadequacies? French biologist Jean Rostand wrote, It does not seem strictly impossible that mutations should have introduced into the animal kingdom the differences which exist between one species and the next. Hence, it is very tempting to lay also at their door the differences between classes, families and orders, and in short, the whole of evolution. But it is obvious that such an extrapolation involves the gratuitous attributions to the mutations of the past of a magnitude and power of innovation much greater than is shown by those of today. In a 2000 Mathematical Intelligencer article entitled A Mathematician's View of Evolution, Granville Sewell wrote the following. If archaeologists of some future society were to unearth the many versions of my PDE solver which I have produced over the last 20 years, they would certainly note a steady increase in complexity over time, and they would see many obvious similarities between each new version and the previous one. In the beginning, it was only able to solve a single linear steady-state 2D equation in a polygonal region. Since then, PDE2D has developed many new abilities. It now solves nonlinear problems, time-dependent and eigenvalue problems, systems of simultaneous equations, and it now handles general curve 2D regions. An archaeologist attempting to explain the evolution of this computer program in terms of many tiny improvements might be puzzled to find that each of these major advances, new classes or phyla, appeared suddenly in new versions. For example, the ability to solve 3D problems first appeared in version 4.0. Less major improvements, new families or orders, appeared suddenly in new subversions. For example, the ability to solve 3D problems with periodic boundary conditions first appeared in version 5.6. In fact, the record of PDE2D's development would be similar to the fossil record with large gaps where major new features appeared and smaller gaps where minor ones appeared. That is because the multitude of intermediate programs between versions or subversions which the archaeologists might expect to find never existed because, for example, None of the changes I made for edition 4.0 made any sense or provided PD2D any advantage whatever in solving 3D problems or anything else until hundreds of lines had been added. To our modern minds, the similarities between species may suggest natural causes. The argument is basically, this doesn't look like the way God would have created things, an argument used frequently by Darwin in Origin of Species. But if the history of life does not give the appearance of creation by magic wand, it does look very much like the way we humans create things, through testing and improvements. In fact, the fossil record does not even support the idea that new organs and new systems of organs arose gradually. New orders, classes, and phyla consistently appear suddenly. We see this same pattern of large gaps where major new features appear in the history of human technology. For example, if some future paleontologist were to unearth two species of Volkswagens, he might find it plausible that one evolved gradually from the other. He might find the lack of gradual transitions between automobile families more problematic, for example, in the transition from mechanical to hydraulic brake systems, or from manual to automatic transmissions, or from steam engines to internal combustion engines. But if he thought about what gradual transitions would look like, he would understand why they didn't exist. There is no way to transition gradually from a steam engine to an internal combustion engine, for example, without the development of new, but not yet useful, features. He would be even more puzzled by the huge differences between the bicycle and motor vehicle phyla, or between the boat and airplane phyla. But heaven help us, when he uncovers motorcycles and hovercraft, the discovery of these missing links would be hailed in all our newspapers as final proof that all forms of transportation arose gradually from a common ancestor, without design. Some people say, of course cars cannot evolve because they cannot reproduce. Well, designing any type of self-replicating machine is still far beyond our current technology. When we add technology to such a machine to get closer to the goal of reproduction, we only move the goalposts because now we have a more complicated machine to reproduce. So how could we imagine that such a machine could have arisen by pure chance? Nevertheless, 
Imagine that we did manage to construct a fleet of cars that contained completely automated car building factories inside, with the ability to construct new cars, and not just normal new cars, but new cars containing automated car building factories inside them. If we left these cars alone and let them reproduce themselves for many generations, is there any chance we would eventually see major advances arise through natural selection of the resulting duplication errors? Of course not. We could confidently predict that the whole process would grind to a halt after a few generations without intelligent humans around to fix the mechanical problems that would inevitably arise, long before we saw duplication errors which held any promise of advances. Devolution is natural. Evolution is not. That it seems even superficially plausible that random mutations could produce major improvements relies completely on the observed but inexplicable fact that while they are awaiting rare favorable mutations, living species are able to preserve their complex structures and pass them on to their descendants without significant degradation, generation after generation. We are so used to seeing this happen that we don't appreciate how astonishing it really is. But if we saw cars reproducing themselves, generation after generation, we might conclude that this actually made the development of cars even more difficult to explain without design. The similarities between the history of life and the history of technology go even deeper. Although the similarities between species in the same branch of the evolutionary tree may suggest common descent, Similarities also frequently arise independently in distant branches where they cannot be explained by common descent. For example, in their Nature Encyclopedia of Life Sciences article on carnivorous plants, Wolf Eckerd Linnig and Heinz Albert Becker note that Carnivory in plants must have arisen several times independently of each other. The pitchers may have arisen seven times separately. Adhesive traps at least four times, snap traps two times, and suction traps possibly also two times. The independent origin of complex, synorganized structures, which are often anatomically and physiologically very similar to each other, appears to be intrinsically unlikely to many authors so that they have tried to avoid the hypothesis of convergence as far as possible. These carnivorous traps, by the way, are all good examples of irreducible complexity. Many features must work together almost perfectly before they can catch and digest victims. Convergence suggests common design rather than common descent. The probability of similar designs arising independently through random processes is very small. But a designer could, of course, take a good design and apply it several times in different places to distantly related species. For example, to give bats and dolphins echolocation abilities. Convergence is a phenomenon often seen in the development of human technology. For example, Ford automobiles and Boeing jets may simultaneously evolve similar new GPS systems. The history of life on Earth appears strikingly similar to the way humans design things, through careful planning, testing, and improvements. As intelligent designers ourselves, we should recognize it when we see this in nature.